The Theft of 39 Girdles by Clark Ashton Smith Let it be said as a forward to this tale that I have robbed no man who is not in some way a robber of others. In my long and arduous career, I, Satampra Zyros, of Uzuldarum, sometimes known as the Master Thief, have endeavored to serve merely as an agent in the rightful redistribution of wealth. The adventure I have now to relate was no exception, though, as it happened in the outcome, my own pecuniary profits were indeed meager, not to say trifling. Age is upon me now, and, sitting at that leisure which I have earned through many hazards, I drink the wines that are heartening to age. To me, as I sip, return memories of splendid loot and brave nefarious enterprise. Before me shine the outpoured sackfuls of jaws or pazores, removed so dexterously from the coffers of iniquitous merchants and moneylenders. I dream of rubies redder than the blood that was shed for them, of sapphires bluer than depths of glacial ice, of emeralds greener than the jungle in spring. I recall the escalade of pronged balconies, the climbing of terraces and towers guarded by monsters, the sacking of altars beneath the eyes of malign idols or sentinel serpents. Often I think of Vexila, my one true love and the most adroit and courageous of my companions in burglary. She has long since gone to the bourne of all good thieves and comrades. I have mourned her sincerely these many years, but still dear is the memory of our amorous, adventurous nights and the feats we performed together. Of such feats, perhaps the most signal and audacious was the theft of the thirty-nine girdles. These were the golden and jeweled chastity girdles, worn by the virgins vowed to the moon god Leniqua, whose temple had stood from immemorial time in the suburbs of Uzuldarum, capital of Hyperborea. The virgins were always thirty-nine in number. They were chosen for their youth and beauty, and retired from service to the god at the age of thirty-one. The girdles were padlocked with the toughest bronze, and their keys retained by the high priest, who, on certain nights, rented them at a high price to the richer gallants of the city. It will thus be seen that the virginity of the priestesses was nominal, but its frequent and repeated sale was regarded as a meritorious act of sacrifice to the god. Vixila herself had at one time been numbered among the virgins, but had fled from the temple and from Uzuldaram several years before the sacerdotal age of release from her bondage. She would tell me little of her life in the temple. I surmised that she had found small pleasure in the religious prostitution and had chaffed at the confinement entailed by it. After her flight, she had suffered many hardships in the cities of the south. Of these two, she spoke but sparingly, as one who dreads the reviving of painful recollections. She had returned to Uzuldarum a few months prior to our first meeting. Being now a little over age, and having dyed her russet blonde hair to a raven black, she had no great fear of recognition by Leniqua's priests. As was their custom, they had promptly replaced her loss with another and younger virgin, and would have small interest now in one so long delinquent. At the time of our foregathering, Vixila had already committed various petty larcenies, but, being unskilled, she had failed to finish any but the easier and simpler ones, and had grown quite thin from starvation. She was still attractive, and her keenness of wit and quickness in learning soon endeared her to me. She was small and agile, and could climb like a lemur. I soon found her help invaluable, since she could climb through windows and other apertures impassable to my greater bulk. We had consummated several lucrative burglaries, when the idea of entering Leniqua's temple and making away with the costly girdles occurred to me. The problems offered, and the difficulties to be overcome, appeared at first sight little less than fantastic, but such obstacles have always challenged my acumen 
and have never daunted me. Firstly, there was the problem of entrance without detection and serious mayhem at the hands of the sickle-armed priests who guarded Leniqua's fane with baleful and incorruptible vigilance. Luckily, during her term of temple service, Vixila had learned of a subterranean adit, long disused, but, she believed, still passable. This entrance was through a tunnel, the continuation of a natural cavern located somewhere in the woods behind Uzuldarum. It had been used almost universally by the Virgin's visitors in former ages, but the visitors now entered openly by the temple's main doors or by posterns little less public. A sign, perhaps, that religious sentiment had deepened or that modesty had declined. Vixila had never seen the cavern herself, but she knew its approximate location. The temple's inner adit was closed only by a flagstone, easily levitated from below or above behind the image of Leniqua in the great nave. Secondly, there was the selection of a proper time, when the women's girdles had been unlocked and laid aside. Here again, Vexila was invaluable, since she knew the nights on which the rented keys were most in demand. These were known as nights of sacrifice, greater or lesser, the chief one being at the moon's full. All the women were then in repeated request. Since, however, the fane on such occasions would be crowded with people, the priests, the virgins, and their clients, a seemingly insurmountable difficulty remained. How are we to collect and make away with the girdles in the presence of so many persons? This, I must admit, baffled me. Plainly, we must find some way in which the temple could be evacuated, or its occupants rendered unconscious, or otherwise incapable during the period needed for our operations. I thought of a certain soporific drug, easily and quickly vaporized, which I had used on more than one occasion to put the inmates of a house asleep. Unfortunately, the drug was limited in its range, and would not penetrate to all the chambers and alcoves of a large edifice like the temple. Moreover, it was necessary to wait for a full half-hour, with doors or windows opened, till the fumes were dissipated. Otherwise, the robbers would be overcome together with their victims. There was also the pollen of a rare jungle lily, which, if cast in a man's face, would induce a temporary paralysis. This, too, I rejected. There were too many persons to be dealt with, and the pollen could hardly be obtained in sufficient quantities. At last, I decided to consult the magician and alchemist, Vizi Benquor, who, possessing furnaces and melting pots, had often served me by converting stolen gold and silver into ingots, or other safely unrecognizable forms. Though skeptical of his powers as a magician, I regarded Vizi Fenquar as a skilled pharmacist and toxicologist. Having always on hand a supply of strange and deadly medicaments, he might well be able to provide something that would facilitate our project. We found Vizi Fenquar decanting one of his more noisome concoctions from a still bubbling and steaming kettle into vials of stout stoneware. By the smell, I judged that it must be something of special potency. The exudations of a polecat would have been innocuous in comparison. In his absorption, he did not notice our presence until the entire contents of the kettle had been decanted and the vials tightly stoppered and sealed with a blackish gum. That, he observed with unctuous complacency, is a love filter that would inflame a nursing infant or resurrect the powers of a dying nonagenarian. Do you? No, I said emphatically. We require nothing of the sort. What we need at the moment is something quite different. In a few terse words, I went on to outline the problem, adding, If you can help us, I am sure you will find the melting down of the golden girdles a congenial task. As usual, you will receive a third of the profits. Vizi Fenquar creased his bearded face into a half-lubricious, half-sardonic smile. The proposition is a pleasant one from all angles. 
We will free the temple girls from encumbrances which they must find uncomfortable, not to say burdensome, and will turn the irksome gems and metal to a worthier purpose, notably our own enrichment. As if by way of afterthought, he added, It happens that I can supply you with a most unusual preparation, warranted to empty the temple of all its occupants in a very short time. Going to a cobwebbed corner, he took down from a high shelf an abdominous jar of uncolored glass filled with a fine gray powder, and brought it to the light. I will now, he said, explain to you the singular properties of this powder, and the way in which it must be used. It is truly a triumph of chemistry, and more devastating than a plague. We were astounded by what he told us. Then we began to laugh. It is to be hoped, I said, that none of your spells and cantrips are involved. Vizi Fanquar assumed the expression of one whose feelings have been deeply injured. I assure you, he protested, that the effects of the powder, though extraordinary, are not beyond nature. After a moment's meditation, he continued, I believe that I can further your plan in other ways. After the abstraction of the girdles, there will be the problem of transporting, undetected, such heavy merchandise across a city which, by that time, may well have been aroused by the horrendous crime, and busily patrolled by constabulary. I have a plan. We hailed with approval the ingenious scheme outlined by Vizi Benquar. After we had discussed and settled to our satisfaction the various details, the alchemist brought out certain liquors that proved more palatable than anything of his we had yet sampled. We then returned to our lodgings, I carrying in my cloak the jar of powder for which Vizi Fanquar generously refused to accept payment. We were filled with rosiest anticipations of success, together with a modicum of distilled palm wine. Discreetly, we refrained from our usual activities during the nights that intervened before the next full moon. We kept closely to our lodgings, hoping that the police, who had long suspected us of numerous peccadilloes, would believe that we had either quitted the city or retired from burglary. A little before midnight, on the evening of the full moon, Vizi Fanquar knocked discreetly at our door. A triple knock, as had been agreed. Like ourselves, he was heavily cloaked in peasant's homespun. I have procured the cart of a vegetable seller from the country, he said. It is loaded with seasonable produce and drawn by two small asses. I have concealed it in the woods as near to the cave at it of Laniqua's temple as the overgrown road will permit. Also, I have reconnoitred the cave itself. Our success will depend on the utter confusion created. If we are not seen to enter or depart by the rear at it, in all likelihood no one will remember its existence. The priests will be searching elsewhere. Having removed the girdles and concealed them under our load of farm produce, we will then wait till the hour before dawn, when, with other vegetable and fruit dealers, we will enter the city." Keeping as far as we could from the public places, where most of the police were gathered around taverns and the cheaper lupinars, we circled across Huzuldarum and found, at some distance from Leniqua's fane, a road that ran countryward. The jungle soon grew denser and the houses fewer. No one saw us when we turned into a side road overhung with leaning palms and closed in by thickening brush. After many devious turnings, we came to the ass-drawn cart, so cleverly screened from view that even I could detect its presence only by the pungent aroma of certain root vegetables. Those asses were well trained for the use of thieves. There was no braying to betray their presence. We groped on, over hunching roots and between clustered bowls that made the rest of the way impassable for a cart. I should have missed the cave, but Vizi Fenquar, pausing, stooped before a low hillock to part the matted creepers, showing a black and bouldered aperture large enough to admit a man on hands and knees. Lighting the torches we had brought along, we crawled into the cave, Vizi going first. Luckily, 
due to the rainless season. The cave was dry, and our clothing suffered only earth stains, such as would be proper to agricultural workers. The cave narrowed where piles of debris had fallen from the roof. I, with my width and girth, was hard put to squeeze through in places. We had gone an undetermined distance when Vesey stopped and stood erect before a wall of smooth masonry in which shadowy steps mounted. Vixila slipped past him and went up the steps. I followed. The fingers of her free hand were gliding over a large, flat flagstone that filled the stairhead. The stone began to tilt noiselessly upward. Vixila blew out her torch and laid it on the top step while the gap widened, permitting a dim, flickering light to pour down from beyond. She peered cautiously over the top of the flag, which became fully up-tilted by its hidden mechanism, and then climbed through, motioning us to follow. We stood in the shadow of a broad pillar at one side of the back part of Laniqua's temple. No priest, woman, or visitor was in sight, but we heard a confused humming of voices at some vague remove. Laniqua's image, presenting its reverend rear, sat on a high dais in the center of the nave. Altar fires, golden, blue, and green, flamed spasmatically before the god, making his shadow writhe on the floor and against the rear wall like a delirious giant in a dance of copulation with an unseen partner. Vixila found and manipulated the spring that caused the flagstone to sink back as part of a level floor. Then the three of us stole forward, keeping in the god's wavering shadow. The nave was still vacant, but noise came more audibly from open doorways at one side, resolving itself into gay cries and hysterical laughters. Now, whispered Vizi Benquar. I drew from a side pocket the vial he had given us, and pried away the wax with a sharp knife. The cork, half rotten with age, was easily removed. I poured the vial's contents on the back bottom step of Laniqua's dais, a pale stream that quivered and undulated with uncanny life and luster as it fell in the god's shadow. When the vial was empty, I ignited the heap of powder. It burned instantly with the clear, high-leaping flame. Immediately, it seemed the air was full of surging phantoms, a soundless, multitudinous explosion beating upon us blasting our nostrils with charnel fetters, till we reeled before it, choking and strangling. There was, however, no sense of material impact from the hideous forms that seemed to melt over and through us, rushing in all directions, as if every atom of the burning powder released a separate ghost. Hastily, we covered our noses with squares of thick cloth that Vizi had warned us to bring for this purpose. Something of our usual aplomb returned, and we moved forward through the seething rout. Lascivious blue cadavers intertwined around us. Missignations of women and tigers arched over us. Monsters double-headed and triple-tailed, goblins and ghouls, rose obliquely to the far ceiling, or rolled and melted to other and more nameless apparitions in lower air. Green sea things, like unions of drowned men and octopi, coiled and dribbled with dank slime along the floor. Then we heard the cries of fright from the temple's inmates and visitors, and began to meet naked men and women, who rushed frantically through that army of beleaguering phantoms toward the exits. Those who encountered us face to face recoiled as if we too were shapes of intolerable horror. The naked men were mostly young. After them came middle-aged merchants and aldermen, bald and pot-bellied, some clad in undergarments, some in snatched-up cloaks too short to cover them below the hips. Women, lean, fat, or buxom, tumbled screaming for the outer doors. None of them, we saw with approbation, had retained their chastity girdle. Lastly came the priests, with mouths like gaping squares of terror emitting shrill cries. All of them had dropped their sickles, they passed us, blindly disregarding our presence, and ran after the rest. 
the host of powder-borne specters soon shrouded them from view. Satisfied that the temple was now empty of its inmates and clients, we turned our attention to the first corridor. The doors of the separate rooms were all open. We divided our labors, taking each a room, and removing from disordered beds and garment-littered floors the cast-off girdles of gold and gems. We met at the corridor's end, where our collected loot was thrust into the strong, thin sack I had carried under my cloak. Many of the phantoms still lingered, achieving new and ghastlier fusions, dropping their members upon us as they began to disreave. Soon we had searched all the rooms apportioned to the women. My sack was full, and I had counted thirty-eight girdles at the end of the third corridor. One girdle was still missing, but Fixila's sharp eyes caught the gleam of an emerald-studded buckle protruding from under the dissolving legs of a hairy, satyr-like ghost on a pile of male garments in the corner. She snatched up the girdle and carried it in her hand henceforward. We hurried back to Laniqua's nave, believing it to be vacant of all human occupants by now. To our disconcertion, the high priest, whose name Vexila knew as Marquanos, was standing before the altar, striking blows with the long phallic rod of bronze, his insignia of office, at certain apparitions that remained floating in the air. Marquanos rushed toward us with a harsh cry as we neared him dealing a blow at a Fixila that would have brained her if she had not slipped agilely to one side. The high priest staggered, nearly losing his balance. Before he could turn upon her again, Fixila brought down on his tonsured head the heavy chastity girdle she bore in her right hand. Marquanos toppled like a slaughtered ox beneath the poleaxe of the butcher, and lay prostrate, writhing a little. Blood ran in rills from the serrated imprint of the great jewels on his scalp. Whether he was dead or still living, we did not pause to ascertain. We made our exit without delay. After the fright they had received, there was small likelihood that any of the temple's denizens would venture to return for some hours. The movable slab fell smoothly back into place behind us. We hurried along the underground passage, I carrying the sack, and the others preceding me, in order to drag it through straightened places and over piles of rubble when I was forced to set it down. We reached the creeper-hung entrance without incident. There we paused a while before emerging into the moon-streaked woods, and listened cautiously to cries that diminished with distance. Apparently no one had thought of the rear at it or had even realized that there was any such human motive as robbery behind the invasion of terrifying specters. Reassured, we came forth from the cavern and found our way back to the hidden cart and its drowsing asses. We threw enough of the fruits and vegetables into the brush to make a deep cavity in the cart's center, into which our sack full of loot was then deposited and covered over from sight. Then, settling ourselves on the grassy ground, we waited for the hour before dawn. Around us, after a while, we heard the furtive slithering and scampering of small animals that discovered the comestibles we had cast away. If any of us slept, it was, so to speak, with one eye and one ear. We rose with the horizontal sifting of the last moonbeams and long eastward-running shadows of early twilight. Leading our asses, we approached the highway and stopped behind the brush while an early cart creaked by. Silence ensued, and we broke from the wood and resumed our journey cityward before other carts came in sight. In our return through outlying streets, we met only a few early passers, who gave us no second glance. Reaching the neighborhood of Vizi Fenquar's house, we consigned the cart to his care and watched him turn into the courtyard unchallenged and seemingly unobserved by others than ourselves. He was, I reflected, well supplied with roots and fruits. We kept closely to our lodgings for two days. It seemed unwise to remind the police of our presence in Uzeldarum by any public appearance. On the evening of the second day, our food supply ran short, and we sallied out in our rural costumes to a nearby market which we had never before patronized. 
Returning, we found evidence that Feezy Vanquar had paid us a visit during our absence, in spite of the fact that all the doors and windows had been, and still were, carefully locked. A small cube of gold reposed on the table, serving as a paperweight for a scribbled note. The note read, My esteemed friends and companions, after removing the various gems, I have melted down all the gold into ingots, and am leaving one of them as a token of my great regard. Unfortunately, I have learned that I am being watched by the police, and am leaving Uzeldarum under circumstances of haste and secrecy, taking the other ingots and all the jewels in the ass-drawn cart, covered up by the vegetables I have providentially kept, even though they are slightly stale by now. I expect to make a long journey in a direction which I cannot specify, a journey well beyond the jurisdiction of our local police, and one on which I trust you will not be perspicacious enough to follow me. I shall need the remainder of our loot for my expenses, etc. Good luck in all your future ventures. Respectfully, Vizi Vanquar. Postscript. You too are being watched and I advise you to quit the city with all feasible expedition. Marquanos, in spite of a well-cracked mazard from Vixila's blow, recovered full consciousness late yesterday. He recognized in Vixila a former temple girl through the trained dexterity of her movements. He has not been able to identify her, but a thorough and secret search is being made, and other girls have already been put to the thumbscrew and toescrew by Laniqua's priests. You and I, my dear Satampra, have already been listed, though not yet identified, as possible accomplices of the girl. A man of your conspicuous height and bulk is being sought. The powder of the fetid apparitions, some traces of which were found on Laniqua's dais, has already been analyzed. Unluckily, it has been used before by both myself and other alchemists. I hope you will escape on other paths than the one I am planning to follow.